Hi everyone and welcome to our biochemistry unit that we are starting. So in this unit we'll learn all about the macronutrients which are carbohydrates, fats, and proteins and also we'll cover chapter 12 on metabolism of all of those macronutrients. So um, you should recognize these different macronutrients from nutrition labels. These are definitely nutrients that are important for diets of pretty much all living things. Um, carbohydrates are the ones that we are going to start with in this chapter and then we'll talk about fats and proteins in the next couple of lectures. So carbohydrates are formed in plants when they undergo the process of photosynthesis which is where they use energy from light to convert carbon dioxide and water into sugars namely glucose the sort of foundational sugar as a byproduct they put out oxygen so another product of photosynthesis is oxygen and then we breathe in that oxygen one of the reasons why plants and photosynthetic organisms are so important to life on earth so the term carbohydrate literally comes from the fact that it's made up of carbon from carbon dioxide and water hydrate so carbohydrate literally because the base formula sorry for the alarm um, is of one C for every H2O so the simple carbohydrates are the monosaccharides and the disaccharides mono meaning one di meaning two so you can see they have these ring structures monosaccharide has one ring and disaccharides have two rings monosaccharides are well both of these actually are commonly referred to as sugars um, the sugars in our diet are either monosaccharides or disaccharides the most common monosaccharide on the planet is glucose because that's the fundamental one that's made in photosynthesis um, disaccharides are two monosaccharides that are chemically bonded together and we'll talk about a few important disaccharides but one that you're probably most familiar with is sucrose which is what table sugar is when you get Dixie crystals when you are adding sugar to your coffee that is basically just pure sucrose there are also larger carbohydrates where we string together many chains or many of these glucose molecules and these are called polysaccharides and polysaccharides are very very long complex carbohydrates so um, the cut the complex carbohydrates in our diet and that are most important that we're going to talk about are starch and fiber so the important monosaccharides are listed here glucose fructose and galactose glucose is also called dextrose sort of in the chemistry field in fact you will see it on on nutrition labels sometimes as under the ingredients you might see it listed as dextrose. A lot of companies will try to hide their sugar content by using fancy terms for sugar, so you can't really tell how, how much they've added. Um, so if you see dextrose on the ingredients list, that's key for sugar. Um, fructose is the sweetest monosaccharide, and it is found primarily in fruits, which is why it has the name fructose. It literally means fruit sugar and it's why fruits are so yummy and nature's dessert because of that fructose sugar. Galactose is not found typically as a monosaccharide in nature. It's found as part of a disaccharide that we commonly ingest. It's found as part of lactose, which is milk sugar. So glucose and galactose combine to make a disaccharide that is lactose. And when we digest milk, we end up with galactose as a monosaccharide in our digestive system. So these are the three important monosaccharides, and they make up the three important disaccharides. Um, another type of monosaccharide, so these are all hexoses. They are all made up of six carbons. But... Um, there are also some important pentoses that we'll talk about later in later chapters that are not, they are still carbohydrates, but they're not important in our diet. So we're focusing on carbohydrates here that are 
really primarily important in our diet. But ribose is another type of sugar. It's a five carbon sugar um, that is really important in our DNA and our RNA, our nucleic acids. So we'll talk about those in the last chapter of the semester. And also they are a part of ATP, the energy molecule of our cells. And we'll talk about that at the end of this unit when we talk about metabolism and how we make ATP from things like other carbohydrates, dietary carbohydrates. So the basic formula, the general formula for a monosaccharide is CNH2ON, remember carbohydrate. So one carbon for every one water molecule essentially. Um, Carbohydrates contain certain functional groups that we learned about these functional groups a little bit. We learned how to identify them in chapter four, but um, we'll revisit that a little bit in this chapter. So the functional groups that are important in carbohydrates are alcohols, aldehydes, and ketones. So carbohydrates can be either an aldehyde or a ketone, they all have either one or the other functional group. If they have an aldehyde functional group, like this one on the left, then we call it an aldose. That suffix os means sugar. So this sugar here has six carbons and an aldehyde functional group, so we call it an aldohexose, meaning it is a sugar with six carbons and an aldehyde group. This one on the right here is a ketopentose. It has a ketone functional group instead of an aldehyde functional group. It has five carbons, penta, and it's a carbohydrate, os. So ketoses have ketone functional groups and aldoses have an aldo, aldehyde functional group. They all have several alcohol functional groups, basically one, almost one sticking off of every carbon. Um, Carbohydrates are also chiral molecules. So they have a carbon that has four different things bonded to it. Sometimes they have several chiral carbons. And remember when we have chiral carbons, that means that the molecule can have handedness, can have a right-handed version and a left-handed version, and we call those enantiomers. So there are enantiomers of carbohydrates. And uh, because carbohydrates are a little bit larger molecules, drawing out the Lewis structure can be a bit of a pain. And so one of the ways that we simplify the structure of carbohydrates is to draw them using this uh, model called the Fisher projection. So if we drew the um, Lewis structure using the wedge and dash marks instead of straight lines, this is what glucose would look like. This in the middle here has stars next to the chiral carbons. So in the Fisher projection, we sort of use make the chiral carbons into sort of skeletal structure here. And so it's just a much simpler way to draw this molecule. You'll see when we draw them that it's much faster. And also it allows us to flip-flop these groups at the chiral carbons in order to show which enantiomer we have, the right-handed or the left-handed one. So to determine whether a carbohydrate is the right-handed or left-handed version, um, right-handed, remember, is D, and left-handed is the letter L. So we use the DL abbreviations for right and left-handed. So the way that we identify this is we look at the last alcohol on the last chiral carbon. So we go down to the last chiral carbon, and we look at the alcohol functional group. And is, if it's on the right side, then this is the D, enantiomer, and if it's on the left side, then this is the L enantiomer. So you're just looking at that last alcohol, or the alcohol group on that last chiral carbon. Now most sugars in our diet, and in our world really, are the D variety. So plants make specifically D glucose, and we have enzymes that match specifically D-glucose. We cannot digest and get energy from L-glucose. So there was actually a period of time where researchers were looking at producing L-glucose as an alternative sweetener, a calorie-free sweetener, because it still um, was 
detected as it had a, having a sweet taste, but we couldn't metabolize it and get calories from it. But it turned out it was just more expensive to make than some other artificial sweeteners. So it never took off, but it was generated. It was a, a possibility. All right, so let's draw some Fisher projections. Um, so we're just going to draw the Fisher projection for the enantiomer of each of these. And the enantiomer is really just the mirror image. We're just flipping it. Remember, it's right-handed and left-handed. So we're just, if we have a mirror coming down the center, we're just drawing the mirror image. So I should specify that we're drawing the mirror image of these chiral carbons here. One, two, three, four chiral carbons. So it doesn't matter if we draw the ones on the end as mirror images. So for this one, I'm not. I'm going to just draw this one the same at the top here. And I draw a long line. I'm going to draw the bottom group, the CH2OH. And then I'm going to draw these bonds coming off the four chiral carbons. One, two, three, four. And then I'm just going to flip everything. So this one has hydrogen on the left and the uh, alcohol on the right. So I'm just going to flip those. Now the alcohol is going to be on the left and the hydrogen is going to be on the right. I flipped the alcohol group as well because you always want hydrogen on the outside. The bond should always be connected to the oxygen. So I'm just going to continue to go down and do that and just flip each of these. I think of it as taking like the bar and just flipping it around. Now that alcohol group is on the right and this alcohol group goes on the left. All right, so maybe try this one yourself. Pause the video and then check yourself. Or you might not even need to pause because I'm a slow drawer, so you could probably beat me. So I'm just drawing the ends. This time I went ahead and, and drew that top part as a mirror image because why not? But the parts that you really have to flip around are the ones on these chiral carbons. So I'm just drawing these. So this one goes, all of the H's are going to flip to the right side. And all of the OH's are going to flip around to the left side. They're going to go from OH to HO. So, ho, ho, ho. It's a Christmas molecule. All right. So the next thing we can do is also, it doesn't ask us to in this problem, but we could identify which one is D, which, whether they're D or L um, enantiomers. And in fact, we don't need to because e, these are, it tells us that this one is the D enantiomer. So likewise, this one would be the one we've drawn is the L enantiomer. But let's just prove it, all right? So we are looking at the last alcohol group or the last chiral carbon, the alcohol group on the last chiral carbon. And this one is, in fact, on the left. So we would call this molecule L galactose. So the name doesn't change, just that um, enantiomer identifier. And the one on the right would be L-ribose. Because again, the last chiral carbon has the OH on the left side. So this would be the L enantiomer of L-ribose. So in a homework or test question, you might be asked to draw the enantiomer of something to identify which is the L and which is the D isomer. You don't need to know the names though. Like you don't need to know whether it's ribose or galactose. I, I would give that to you in the problem. So I would say here's a molecule of ribose. Is it the D or L enantiomer? So earlier in the slides, we saw when we I introduced monosaccharides and disaccharides, we saw them as ring structures, yet we've just been drawing them as linear Fisher projections. So the truth is sugars can exist in both forms. They can exist as straight chains and also as rings. They prefer to be in the ring form though. And when they form a ring, they can form it either by, if you think of the 
sugar as being something that can fold forward or it can fold, my finger can't fold backwards, but the sugar, the fissure protection, if you think of it as like a standing straight up, all right, it can either fold forward and touch its toes this way, or it can fold backwards and touch its toes that way. And depending on which way it folds, it will form a slightly different ring structure. And so we call these different structures animers. So the different ring forms are the two different animers. If it folds forward, it's the alpha animer. If it folds backwards, it's the beta animer. So you don't need to know how to identify these, but we will see these, these de, um, delineations of alpha and beta when we talk about naming of carbohydrates. So I just wanted you to know where those came from, but this isn't an organic chemistry class truly. So we're not gonna have to learn the difference between these structures, but just know that there's each each carbohydrate can form two different anomers, two different, slightly different ring structures, depending on which way it folds. All right, so now let's talk about the disaccharides, when we take two monosaccharides and we fuse them together. So when we do that, this is an example of how that reaction occurs. All right, it's a reaction where you take two monosaccharides and you are connecting them together. So it's a type of synthesis reaction. You're building a larger molecule. And one of the products is water. So we're removing two um, hydrogens and one oxygen from these two molecules in order to make this bond. So does that make this a condensation or a hydrolysis reaction? Hopefully you said a condensation reaction. Condensation reactions have water as the product Hydrolysis reactions have water as the reactant. So the reverse reaction would be hydrolysis. This bond that connects the two monosaccharides together is called a glycosidic bond. Glycos coming from the term for sugar. So it's basically the scientific word for a sugar bond. We call these glycosidic linkages or glyco glycosidic bonds. So when we name glycosidic bonds, we name them based on whether or not they contain alpha linkages or beta linkages. So the, if we have two alpha glucose molecules and we link them together, they make a molecule that looks like this where the oxygen is pointing down. And this disaccharide is called maltose, right? But if we take two beta anomers and we link them together, this is called cellobios. So these two, even though they're made up of two glucose molecules, right, they're different. They form different disaccharides and will form different polysaccharides if we kept adding on to them because of the location of these alcohol groups on these different anomers. So we would call this one on top an alpha 1,4 glycosidic bond because it's between two alpha anomers and it connects carbon 1 of the first one to carbon four of the second one. So alpha one four linkages make four very straight um, chains that we'll see. And uh, these beta linkages, when we have two beta anomers and we connect them at the carbon one and four, this would be a beta one four glycosidic bond. So we'll see glycosidic bonds labeled like this, whether it's, it tells us whether it's alpha anomers or beta anomers and it tells us what carbons are connected together. So that's how glycosidic bonds are named. It looks kind of complicated, but it's actually very explanatory of the structure of that bond. All right, so you don't need to know for our disaccharides, you don't need to know those, the different, whether it's an alpha linkage or a beta linkage, but we, it will come back into play when we talk about the polysaccharides. But before we get off the topic of disaccharides. Let's talk about the important disaccharides in our diets. Maltose, lactose, and sucrose. Maltose is made up of two parts of glucose, so it's a disaccharide of two glucose molecules. And maltose is also known as malt sugar. If you ever had like a malted milkshake, you are tasting maltose. Otherwise, malt sugar, maltose, is not really found as a free disaccharide in many foods. It's found a lot though in our digestive tract when we digest 
starches, which are just long chains of glucose. So when we digest them, we break it up into maltose. So it's important in our digestive system. Lactose is milk sugar. It's found in dairy products. And it is made of one part glucose and one part galactose. Um, and sucrose, so lactose is actually the only carbohydrate we get from animals. All the other carbohydrates in our diet come from plants because plants make, primarily make carbohydrates. Um, sucrose is probably the most common sugar in our diets and it is made up of one part glucose, one part fructose, and it is our, you know, common table sugar. So I guess well, I'll add one more thing here. So when we people talk about high fructose corn syrup. It is corn syrup that is actually made up of free glucose and fructose molecules. And so normally sucrose would be, sucrose is 50-50, half glucose, half fructose. High fructose corn syrup is about 45% glucose and 55% fructose. So it has a little extra fructose, makes it a little sweeter than sucrose, which is why it's used and it's really cheap to produce from corn. We have, have a huge production of corn in this country. Um, so high fructose corn syrup does not differ terribly significantly from sucrose. It's still made up of glucose and fructose. The differences are it has slightly higher concentration of fructose and these two molecules are separated. They are freely floating around as monosaccharides, not as a disaccharide. Um, all right, so now for our polysaccharides, our complex carbohydrates, long chains, poly means many, and saccharide means a sugar. So um, the two sort of classes of polysaccharides that we have, we have storage polysaccharides and structural polysaccharides. So storage polysaccharides are, are polymers, long chains of glucose, that are for the purpose of storing energy. So we can break down poly, these storage polysaccharides when we need glucose. Um, the two important types of storage polysaccharides that we'll discuss are starch, which is in plants, and glycogen, which is the storage polysaccharide in animals. And these contain alpha linkages. As it turns out, these alpha linkages of alpha anomers are easier to break. We have enzymes uh, free, we have an abundance of enzymes that can break alpha linkages. Structural polysaccharides are more rigid and these beta linkages, they're connected by beta linkages and they are harder to break. So they make for very good strong molecular materials that we can use to build structures. So we'll talk about um, two important structural polysaccharides, cellulose, which is an important building molecule in plants, and chitin, which is an important building molecule in some types of animals. So let's first talk about these storage polysaccharides. So storage polysaccharides always contain alpha linkages. So because those alpha linkages are easier to break, it's easier to break off glucose molecules. Starch is the storage polysaccharide found in plants, um, various plant foods. And there's two types of starch. There's amylose and amylopectin. We'll talk about the enzyme for breaking down carbohydrates is called amylase. So that amylo is a combining form that means, um, or a word root, that means carbohydrate, really more specifically polysaccharide. Okay, so amylose is a totally straight chain of just um, glucose units bonded together through alpha-1-4 linkages. So it's just this continuous chain. Amylopectin is a branched chain. So it has a straight chain of alpha-1-4 linkages, but then occasionally there are these branch points, and those branch points are caused by alpha-1-6 linkages. So Amylo, amylose could be described as a polysaccharide that is just a continuous chain of alpha-1-4 linkages. And amylopectin, which is actually the more common form of starch, is made up of alpha-1-4 and alpha-1-6 linkages. That's what causes those branches. So the branched form 
is easier to get energy from because when our enzymes break down starch, they break it down from the ends. And amylose only has two ends, the left end and the right end. But amylopectin, when there's all those branches, there's multiple end points. So you can break down, you can break it down faster and, and get glucose from it faster. Um, since plants don't typically need a lot of energy on short notice, they just stand there. They don't have to move. They don't have to run around. So their metabolism is a bit slower. So amylose, that straight chain form, is one that they can use for long-term energy storage. Also consider the fact that they make polysaccharides, so they have a ton and need to have a place to store them for long term. Animals don't have a straight chain version of polysaccharides because we don't store a ton of carbohydrates. We typically store them short term and use them. And when we need to use them, we need them very quickly um, because we expend a lot more energy than plants do in the fact that we move. So um, Glycogen is the form of, of uh, storage polysaccharide in animals. You find it in the muscle tissue and in the liver are the two most common places for glycogen storage. And you'll notice that glycogen looks very similar to amylopectin. The difference is there are more branches. So the um, alpha-1-6 linkages happen more frequently in glycogen. So glycogen is the storage form of starch in animals. Amylose and amylopectin, collectively known as starch, are the storage forms of glucose in, in uh, plants. Um, when it comes to structural polysaccharides, these are going to be ones that are connected through beta linkages. And the most common structural polysaccharide on the planet is cellulose. Cellulose is made by plants, so they make all that glucose for energy that they store, but they also use it to make their plant structures. Um, plants are primarily built from cellulose. So cellulose, these beta linkages, allow those beta chains to pack really tightly, and that makes them very rigid structures. So you can build things like stems and bark and leaves are all composed of cellulose. Cellulose is also very difficult to digest because breaking these beta linkages is very difficult. Humans, as it turns out, do not have the requisite enzymes to break down um, cellulose. In fact, most animals do not contain those enzymes, but some animals contain bacteria in their guts that can break down cellulose. Most animals, I'm digressing a little bit here, but most animals that eat plant-based diets have some form of digesting food multiple times. So ruminants like cattle have four chambered stomachs. They swallow food and then they like regurgitate it into their mouths and chew on it some more. That's called chewing the cud. And then they swallow it again and it, and it moves through these four different parts of the stomach where it encounters bacteria that can actually break down the cellulose. Some animals like rabbits will actually eat their poop. They will digest it once They'll eat grass and they'll poop it. They'll digest it once and poop it out and then they eat their poop again. They eat their poop so they can digest it a second time. So that's how strong these beta linkages are and how difficult they are to really break down um, and why they make such good building structures and why they're so difficult to digest. Chitin, it's spelled chitin but it's pronounced chitin, is a building material that arthropods use in their exoskeletons. Also some fungi, it's found in um, several species of fungus. So this is a modified polysaccharide. So if you look at these individual uh, rings, they, ha they have some, these nitrogen groups coming off of it or these amid groups coming off of it. So they have additional groups. So they're not just, it's a carbohydrate sort of backbone, but it has these additional functional groups sticking off of it. Um, and, but it also has these beta linkages, which makes it very strong and rigid and makes for a very good exoskeleton material. Um, both of these things being not digestible, at least we often refer to these in our diet as fiber, dietary fiber. Cellulose is a type of dietary fiber, these undigestible polysaccharides. We typically don't eat ingest chitin in any foods that we consume. 
Um, we don't ingest if any crustaceans or arthropods that we eat. We don't usually eat the exoskeleton. Um, but alas, you can find supplemental chitin um, as like a like dietary fiber or um, kind of filling, like diet like diet pills that that claim to make you feel full faster. Oftentimes are just powdered chitin. So a common theme in both chemistry and biology and anatomy is that structure equals function, that organs are designed structurally to maximize their function. And same thing with molecules, it can be true of molecules. So cellulose is a structural polysaccharide. Its structure is designed to be very rigid. Um, it's like, you know, a molecular wooden plank if you will. It's all on a plane, so it's all these molecules that are attached flat together, and they have a lot of attractive forces that hold them in that, in that rigid state, and so they make for great building materials. Starch, amylose, all right, is that long continuous strain of glucose molecules, and it actually will coil like a telephone cord. And the purpose of that is, remember, starch, amylose, is really for long-term storage of energy. So you want it to be compact and not take up a lot of space. And when it does this natural coil, that's a really space-saving feature of that molecular structure, why it works really well as long-term energy storage. And the branched structure of glycogen and amylopectin is ideal for getting quick energy because it has multiple end points that we can break up those ends um, pretty quickly. So a quick pop question here. Identify the polysaccharide that is described by each of the following. So you should be able to recognize polysaccharides both visually by their structures and also by description. So um, the first one, A, a polysaccharide that is stored in the liver and muscle tissue. So the first key here is we're looking for a polysaccharide. So we're not talking about glucose or sucrose or lactose. The polysaccharides are starch and glycogen. So the one that's stored in liver and muscle, well, starch is a plant variety. So the only polysaccharide that's found in animals that have liver and muscle tissue, that is glycogen. Um, a component of starch, so we're talking about a polysaccharide here that's found in plants, that contains only alpha-1 glycosidic bonds. So only one type of linkage leads to a straight chain. The straight chain starch is amylose, and the branch chain one is amylopectin. So amylose is the one we're looking for here. And then lastly, a polysaccharide that's found in the exoskeleton of insects, that one we learned is called chitin. Chitin. All right, so, so far we've really focused on carbohydrates that are important in the diet. Um, but there's one other class of carbohydrates that we have to talk about that's really important in biology and biochemistry. And these are sort of the in-betweeners. These are called the oligosaccharides. So monosaccharides, disaccharides, and polysaccharides are ones that we find really important in the diet. But these oligosaccharides are short chains. Oligo means few. So this is anywhere from three to nine different monosaccharides linked together. And oligosaccharides are commonly found on the surface of cells. And they serve as sort of, I think of them as cellular name tags. So that's why I have this little cartoon here. But so you might see these oligosaccharides just sticking off of cells. And these are markers um, that say, I am a liver cell, or I'm Sarah's cell, or I am a cell that goes to in the nervous system. Um, and so, so all the cells in your body really are covered in these different oligosaccharide tags. But 
um, one of the most important groups of oligosaccharide tags that we'll discuss are the ABO blood groups. So the, your blood type is based on which oligosaccharides you have sticking off of your red blood cells. But all tissues in the body have various um, oligosaccharide name tags. So let's talk about the blood group one. So the ABO, um, these oligosaccharides that stick off the cells are called, we call them antigens. So there's the A, the B, and the type O antigens. An antigen is anything that the body makes antibodies against. And usually we make antibodies against foreign things. So your body will make antibodies against foreign blood antigens. So if you are type O, you make antibodies to type A and B. This is what those oligosaccharides look like. They have three or four monosaccharides attached together. You'll notice the difference between, so A and B have four and they are branched, all right? Type O only has three and it is straight. It does not have a branch point. So type O is actually too small for our immune system to recognize and make antibodies against. So there are no antibodies against type O antigens. So we've got A, B, and O, and not A, B, and C. The O sort of represents zero antibodies are made against it. It's sort of like um, a non-antigen. Okay, so this is a really good table for looking at the different blood types and the different antigens and antibodies. So type A has the A antigen uh, surrounding it. And so people who have type A blood and produce A antigens, they make anti-B antibodies. They make antibodies against the B antigen. So if they were given type B blood, their body would attack the type B. Those antibodies would bind to the type B antigen and cause lead to the destruction of those blood cells. Same thing with people who have type B blood. So I'm B positive. I have B antigens on my red blood cells. If I was given type A blood, my body makes anti-A antibodies and would attack those blood cells. They'd also attack any blood cells that were type AB. So you get one um, allele from your mom and one from your dad. So if your mom is type A and your dad is type B, you might end up being type AB, meaning you produce both antigens, A and B, which is... Um, beneficial, I suppose, because then you don't make any antibodies. People with type AB blood can receive any other blood type. They are the universal acceptor, so they can accept type B blood, type A blood, type O blood. They can take it all because they don't actually make any antibodies. No blood type is foreign to them. People with type O blood, though, those antigens, remember, are very small, and there's actually no anti-O antibodies. So type O is the universal donor. Anyone can get type O blood because there's no antibodies that attack it. However, people who have type O blood will make antibodies against the A and B antigens. So they can't get any other blood type except for type O. So type O is sort of the, um, the golden blood type, or it's, the, it's um, the one that blood banks are always really looking for because it's so versatile. You can give it to anyone. It's necessary for people with type O blood, but can also be given to people with other blood types. So if you have type O blood and you've ever donated before, you probably get a lot of phone calls requesting you to come donate blood again because your blood, your blood type is very desirable from blood blank, in blood banks. So quick pop quiz here. Explain whether the following blood types should be donated to a person with type A blood. Right. If somebody has type A blood, then it's sort of a duh that yes, they can get type A blood. Sure thing, that, that's a match. All right. Can they get type B blood? No, because they make antibodies towards B that attack B, and that would not be a match. Can they get type AB blood, though? They are type A, so they do match the A. All right. But the B antigens will be seen as foreign, and so those blood cells will be attacked. So you cannot give someone with type A blood, you cannot give them any blood that has B antigens on it, even if it also has A antigens. Um, you can give them O blood, though. You can give anyone type O blood because type O is the universal donor. 
And that's where we'll stop with carbohydrates and I'll do fats in a separate lecture.